good morning. My name is Reese Kia Aina, and I want to welcome you to the mighty metro region of the Los Angeles International Church of Christ. Thank you for tuning in and participating in our Sunday worship service. Shout out to our San Francisco family, friends throughout the world, and of course, our very own metro family. I hope your January has been great for you. We have had a spiritual workshop, a 12-hour prayer train, prayer, prayer chain <laughs> that many of us uh, have participated in, as well as we are in our third week of spiritual formation or Christian formation, and we've also participated in a few community service events throughout January. You know, our theme for 2022 is Encouraged by the Spirit. And we have been talking a lot about the Spirit, a topic that can be quite confusing sometimes. Have you ever felt like talking about the Spirit is a very foreign and confusing confusing topic in Christianity? I know for me, that's how I felt uh, very early on in my life about, about anything with church and the Spirit. You know, my first experience of being exposed to the Spirit, right, or uh, that seemed confusing was in Honolulu, Hawaii. I was 21 years old at the time. I was studying the Bible in 1992. And while I was studying the Bible, I visited an all-black church on the west side of the island. And when I think about it now, I was like, wow, it was, it was, a, it was a pretty uh, neat event. But it was also a scary and confusing uh, time in my life. And that was the first time I went to an all-black church. Worship was outstanding. And two things happened that was confusing at best to me is number one, people were speaking in tongues at this worship service that I was at. And you know, the kind where people shout, they yell, they pray in the spirit, they shake. And it was quite scary to be honest. You know, please know as I share this, I mean, no disrespect to anyone who has had an experience like this before. Perhaps that's how they grew up in a church like that. I'm in no way trying to show any kind of disrespect there. That was just, that was just my interpretation, my experience of that event that I was in. And for me, being a pagan, that was a very new and scary and confusing experience. The second thing happened at that service is the preacher asked the crowd, does anybody want to be saved this evening? And I was there with my friend and his mother. And my friend's mom said, she raised her hand and she said, my son does. And she pointed to me because, you know, I was like part of her family like that. And and so the ushers came to us, they brought me, and I was the only, uh, I, you know, when she raised her hand, she was the only one that night amongst 200 people that, that had her hand up. So the ushers brought me up on stage in front of the whole church of about 200 people. The pastor asked me some questions. Then a few people gathered around me and he put his hand over my face and he said in the power of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, you are a child of God and now you are saved. Then he pushed me to the ground and I fell back in the arms of two men catching me. And the crowd started clapping and screaming. And as Augustus uh, would say, in the name of Jesus, you know, that was my first experience regarding anything surrounding the Holy Spirit, whether I even understood it or not, whether it was true or not. You know, I didn't understand it, believe it, or ever want to do that again, to be quite honest. I was so confused. I knew that that wasn't the way I be that somebody became a Christian because I was actually studying the Bible at that time. You know, sometimes when we talk about the Holy Spirit, it can be quite daunting and confusing. Our lesson today is a step in that direction of understanding who the Spirit is, what the Spirit does, and how we can access His divine power. My lesson is entitled, The Power of the Spirit. The Power of the Spirit. My hope is that our faith will be encouraged and empowered this morning. Let's pray. God, we love you. We thank you. We pray for power this morning that uh, you would use me in a way that could be clear about the Spirit and that we could gain in, get a lot of information about the Spirit, what the Spirit, who the Spirit is, what the Spirit does, and more importantly, how we can access that power in our daily lives. God, inspire us, challenge us, encourage us, speak to us today. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, this March, I will have been a Christian for 30 years. <clears throat> three decades, and only since 2018 to 2020 in grad school did I learn more about the Spirit, His role, and His power in our lives. 
I'm still a novice in this era, but I'm growing. For most of my Christian life, I'd say I knew very little of the Spirit. I didn't really understand the gift I was given at baptism in Acts 2, verse 36 to 38, and more so the power that came with that gift in my life. I'd say I operated on 20% power. Can you relate to this this for a minute? That we operate on 20% power. Because I knew so little of the Spirit, I operated more on my strength than the Spirit strength. Can you relate to that? Imagine, though, if we could live life operating at 50%, 75%, or 90% on the Spirit's power, what would my life be like? What would our lives be like? What would the quality of our lives be like? What risks would we take in our lives if we knew we had more power to start a new dream, complete a huge task, or finish a lifelong project that we desired? So who is the Spirit? I want to show a video from the Bible Project that talks about the Holy Spirit. I learn visually and it helps us see things more clearly when talking about the Holy Spirit. Enjoy. If you've ever heard the phrase, the Holy Spirit, and you want to know what it means, where do you start? Well, you have to start on page one of the Bible, where the uncreated world is depicted as this dark, chaotic place. But then above the chaos, God's Spirit is there, hovering, ready to bring about life and order and beauty. Okay, but... What is God's Spirit? Yeah, so the Spirit is the way the biblical authors talk about God's personal presence. The Hebrew word is ruach. Ruach. Yeah, you got to clear your throat at the end. So what is it? Well, ruach can refer to a number of different things, but what they all have in common is energy. Energy? How so? So there's an invisible energy that makes the clouds move or the tree branches sway. Right. Wind. So in Hebrew, that's ruach. Okay. Now take a big breath. (sighs) So you feel that inside you. Yeah, the air? Well, specifically the energy, right? The vitality in your body that you get from breathing deeply. That too is ruach. And this is the same word used in the Bible to describe God's personal presence. Just like wind and breath are invisible, God's spirit is invisible. Wind is powerful, and so God's spirit is powerful. And just as breath keeps us alive, so God's spirit sustains all of life. Yeah, ruach. Now, as we continue on in the story of the Bible, we see God's Ruach giving special empowerment to people for specific tasks. The first person in the Bible this happens to is Joseph. God's Spirit enables him to understand and interpret dreams. And then it happens to this guy named Bezalel, and he's an artist. God's Spirit empowers him with wisdom and skills. He's given creative genius to make beautiful things in the tabernacle. And we also see God's Ruach empower a group of people called the prophets. They're able to see what's happening happening in history from God's point of view. That's exactly right. And here's the problem as the prophets saw it. While God's Ruach had created a really good world, humans have given in to evil. They've unleashed chaos into it through their injustice. A new type of disorder. Yes. And the prophet said the spirit would come, just like in Genesis 1, but now to transform the human heart, to empower people to truly love God and others. How will this new act of God's spirit happen? Well, centuries pass and we are introduced to Jesus. And at the beginning of his mission, there's this beautiful scene where Jesus is being baptized in the waters of the Jordan River. Yeah, the sky opens up and God's spirit comes and rests on him like a bird. This story is saying that God's spirit is empowering Jesus to begin the new creation. And we see this happening when he heals people or forgives their sins. He's creating life where there once was death. Now, Israel's religious leaders oppose Jesus and they eventually have him killed. But even here, God's spirit is at work. The earliest disciples of Jesus, who saw him alive from the dead, said it was God's energizing spirit that raised Jesus. This is the beginning of new creation. Yes, and it's still going. When Jesus appeared to his closest followers, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And soon after that, the spirit powerfully comes on all of his disciples. So that they can become a part of this new creation and share the good news and learn how to live by the energy and influence of God's spirit. And so today, the spirit is still hovering in dark places. Yes, pointing people to Jesus, transforming and empowering them so they can love God and others. And the Christian hope is that the spirit is going to finish the job. 
The story of the Bible ends with a vision of a new humanity living in a new world that's permeated with God's love and life-giving spirit. I hope that was a great appetizer on the Holy Spirit in three minutes. There is so much to learn on this topic, it would take a lifetime. The Spirit is all throughout the Bible, but because we can be a bit malnourished in spirit theology, if you're like me, we miss seeing the Spirit in the Bible and even more so perhaps in our lives. In fact, there is a quote from Michael Green in a book, a great book uh, by Leonard Allen called Pour It Out. One of the books that I, that I had to read in grad school that is quite challenging. You know, he said, for some Christians, the Bible is the safest place for the spirit. That is where he belongs, not in the hurly burly of real life. But the thing is, the spirit was indeed not only in the Bible, right? But actively involved in creation the incarnation, and new creation in our lives. He is in the hurly and burly of our lives. He is in the messy details of our lives. That's where he does his best work. Our triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit, have been actively you know, uh, involved in creation, working to reconcile and restore a lost world to new creation. You and I as Christians get to participate in that mission, experiences power to help in that mission. So let's talk about what does the Spirit do? What is His role in our lives? And I want to show us some imagery in the Bible today. And, and I hope this encourages you in your faith. In 2 Peter chapter 1, and there's so, there's, like I could give you over 50 ways the Spirit uh, is involved in our lives, but I'm only going to give you eight right now real quick. In 2 Peter 1, Peter says, above all, uh, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets through human spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. This is the NI version of, of, of Peter talking. You know, Peter says that the Spirit was involved in creating Scripture. That's what is unique about the Bible. You know, the Hebrew writer perhaps says it best that the Word of God is living and active. That means that the Bible, the Word of God is alive. It's active. It's dynamic. It's living. It could search you out. It can move you, inspire you, convict you, feed you, dazzle you, even cut you. You will experience the Spirit's power in Scripture. And, and that's a powerful thing. And often sometimes in our, in our ICOC tradition, that's where perhaps we have kept the Spirit, just in the Bible. Not, not, that he is, not that we are always taught that He is active in the world today, as if He is moving and grooving the way God does in the world. But He is active in the world today. We experience His power through Scripture, through the Word of God. That's why it's so important for us to be involved in the Word of God. You know, Robert sent out a 40-day meditation packet, and here it is. I hope I hope you got this. If you didn't, email me, look at the newsletter. You can get more information on it. Talk to some of the leaders and members in our church because uh, we want to encourage you with this. Just 40 days of meditation, 40 days of another way of trying to engage God in Scripture, in prayer, as well as in community. And I hope you get to experience the Spirit's power in the written word. And that's a powerful thing. I'm not, uh, you know, I, I want to just encourage us how important the word of God is. It's so important. But sometimes in our context, we kind of just leave the Spirit. They're not realizing the Spirit is not just in the Bible and in Scripture, but He is actively working in the world. He is a person of the Trinity, of the triune Godhead, right? And I hope we get to experience that. In John chapter 14, another way we get to experience the Spirit's power and what He does is in John 14, in verse 15 to 17, it says, If you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and He will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept Him because it neither sees Him nor knows Him, but you know Him for he lives with you and will be in you. The awesome thing about being a Christian, man, is that if you're a Christian, the spirit of, of truth, an advocate. Of, in, in other translations, he's a comforter. He provides comfort in our lives. 
somebody who's standing up for you, pr providing comfort for you. You know, in the Greek, the word here is, is for advocate or comforter is one who comes alongside of us to be with us, providing comfort in our lives. You know, when I was a young Christian, a brother once told me, it was so good advice, that you either are heading into a trial, currently in one, or coming out of one. <laughs> Boy, ain't that the truth. These last two years have been rough for everyone. And it's good to know that when we are in a trial, the Spirit is actively comforting us, advocating for us. And our job is to look for the Spirit surprise in the midst of the trial. Too often we're looking down instead of looking for the Spirit's participation in our lives while in the trial. You know, a great example of this is when our church was going through a pretty rough time a couple of years ago. And, and, and we were in perhaps one of the biggest trials that we've been in going through a split like that. We were looking to hire a new couple, right? And our church was pretty sad at that time. And we were kind of down and out, if you will. And we were going through the pr process of hiring the Carrillos. And, you know, two couples were interviewed and the, the, the ministry leadership council, the staff, our interview team and our membership really didn't have an act six, this please the whole group moment you know, uh, about hiring those couples. And so what did we do? It was a pretty stressful time. I remember feeling stressed out myself. Well, while I was feeling stressed, little did I know that the Carrillos had resigned from Hope Worldwide and were looking to go back into the full-time ministry and leading a church. And there was a, uh, there was a post, I believe, of, of, of that, uh, of, the Carrillo's resigning and, and it got word to us and the rest is history. We interviewed them in one weekend and had unity in one weekend and hired them. I mean, I look back at that time and I just go, wow, it, it was totally the Spirit's leadership guiding us because none of us knew what was going on and how we were going to come out of this. Yet the Spirit was advocating for us, comforting us and working out things behind the scenes in the spirit of all truth to be able to come forward and the Carrillos came we've all met with them and it was a marriage made in heaven if you will and they're here now and it just reminds me of the spirit's power in John 14 and verse 25 another role of the spirit how the spirit is actively involved and gives us power in our lives is, is in John 14 and verse 25 I have spoken these words while I am here with you the Father is sending a great helper, the Holy Spirit, in my name to teach you. So the Spirit is like a helper to teach you everything and to remind you of all I have said to you. This is the voice translation in John chapter 14. The Holy Spirit will be a helper who will teach and remind us of everything Jesus said. Isn't that a powerful thing? Even if you didn't, like if you didn't have your Bible, the Holy Spirit, if you're a Christian, would teach you and remind you everything of Jesus. Now, I'm not, I'm not advocating for not reading our Bibles, right? Obviously, let's read our Bibles. But if we're worried, you know, about, man, if I miss a quiet time, if I do, if I'm so busy and sometimes I miss some things, the Holy Spirit is there to help us. That's the power we have. I appreciate uh, when I think of a helper, I think of my grandmother, you know, who just helped me in every area of my life. Uh, I think of grace, both of them lifesavers. I think of, I think of different people who have helped me, different discipleship partners that have helped to remind me and all that. But, you know, as, as much as people will remind me of different things, the Holy Spirit is so much greater than that is a helper who will teach and remind us everything Jesus said. Isn't that, look at the power that we have. If we can just, we can relax and rest in, in assurance, knowing that as Christians, we're given this kind of help in our lives. So you should never say, I'm alone. I'm, I, I don't feel helped in my life like that. Because you have a helper. You have a counselor. You have an advocate. And it's such a powerful thing for us to just understand. In James, in John chapter three, another thing about the uh, spirit's row is the process of rebirth. The process of rebirth. In John chapter three, in verse three to five, Jesus answered Nicodemus, who was a Pharisee who came to Jesus at night and and wanted to know more about him. Jesus answered Nicodemus, "Listen to this eternal truth. Before a person can even perceive God's kingdom, they must first experience a rebirth." 
Nicodemus said, rebirth? How can a gray-headed man be reborn? It's impossible for anyone to go back into the womb a second time and reborn. Jesus answered, I speak an eternal truth. This, Unless you are born of water and the Spirit, you will never enter God's kingdom. This is John chapter 3, verse 3 to 5 in the passage translation. The Spirit's activity, the Spirit's involvement uh, has to do with the process of rebirth. The Spirit helps people in the process of rebirth to become Christians and learn about being born again. I mean, what a what an awesome thing. And it can take the pressure of us as we're trying to study the Bible with people and involve people in a process of rebirth, of getting to know God and getting to know the scriptures. You know, Jesus said that the spirit is actively at work in the rebirth of someone's souls. It's not up to you. It's not up to me. You know, and that's so encouraging to know. You know, let me give you an example of that. In in my own studies, okay, when we were we had a study called the Kingdom Study. And these two guys that were doing the Kingdom Study, bless their hearts. They were awesome brothers, you know. But they botched the Kingdom Study. They 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 taught me stuff and I was so confused at the end of the study that I add, you know, there's all these words about the kingdom, the mountain of the Lord, you know, and the big statue. Right? Some of you remember that study that we've done in our in our study series. And I was so confused at the end of the study. You know, I asked the brothers, hey, are you guys asking me to come to church a little bit more like that? And they're like, yes, we're asking you. Okay, go, okay I'm in. <laughs> That's that's exactly how my kingdom study went. Now, now you know, there, there's more to learn about the kingdom in the church, right? We obviously know now that they're two different things. Uh, but, you know, the, the church is actively in the kingdom of God in a small outpost where we as Christians get to live and experience heaven on earth now. And we get to live that out. But in my kingdom study, gang, they did it wrong. You know, it, it somebody botched the scriptures and yet... I still was open at that time. Even in my light and darkness study, you know, I was an athlete back then and a guy who reached out to me was an athlete. And and in my light and darkness study, two athletes were in that study with me and both of them were fighting over who would read the scripture to me. Can you imagine that? Two guys were studying with me and fighting over who gets to read a scripture. They had to go outside. They were like, hey, Reese, hold on one second. We'll be right back. They went outside and they were trying to work it out. They came back. They would read scripture. One other guy would read it. And I was like, what is going on here? Uh, but you know what? I still became a Christian. That that didn't stop me. I, I, they, could they have learned? Could they have gotten their act together and did a better job? Sure. But you know what? We're going to mess things up. It's okay. I still became a Christian. God was still opening my heart because the Spirit is the one guiding. The Spirit is the one in charge of the process of rebirth. The point is that it's it's not up to you, you know. I'm saying, yes, we should be prepared and take seriously our role in helping people to become Christians. But when things go wrong, the Spirit's got it. It takes the pressure off us. Jesus said that the Spirit is actively at work. You know, in, in, in Romans 8, Paul said, In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And He who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. In Romans chapter 8, 26 to 27 in the NIV, you know, the, the Spirit's role also is to help us in our time of weakness. You know, and it's okay to be weak. We can relax if we're weak. I'm not saying strive to be weak. I'm saying strive to be strong. Grow in the grace that helps us to be strong. But if we are weak, and if we're at a downtime in our lives, it's okay. Well, why? Because we got a helper in our corner. The Spirit intercedes for us. And another role, He helps us in our time of weakness. It's like you got a personal trainer or coach helping you, a life coach, spiritual coach, helping you in your time of weakness. And I'm so encouraged by that. Uh, I, I know that when I'm, when I'm weak, wow, I, I'm more aware now. 
that the Spirit is constantly trying to help me. So I need to pay attention. Maybe maybe someone is reaching out to me. Maybe somebody's making a comment to me. Maybe someone's calling me so that I can kind of, you know, reach out like that. And, and perhaps the Spirit is using them to influence me. You know, the, God works in s- such amazing ways. It a, a lot of times, though, we're not paying attention, especially when we're weak. We're usually kind of just so focused on self. That's how I am. And and it's so good to know that we have power it, it, because we have help in our weakness. Amen. Paul also said another thing that, that the Spirit actively does in our life. In Romans chapter 5, in, in it says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, to whom we also have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we celebrate in hope of this, the glory of God. And not only this, but we also celebrate in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance and perseverance proven character and proven character hope. And hope does not disappoint us. Disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has who was given to us. This is the Romans chapter 5, verse 1 through 5 in the New American Standard Version. Another way the Spirit is actively involved in our lives is that He pours out love into our hearts, into our lives. Look at the imagery here, right? Imagine a pitcher and, and a glass and the, the spirit being the pitcher and the glass being us and our hearts and the, the spirit is pouring love into our hearts, into our lives. What a great, I mean, that, that's, that's how empowered we are. That's why you have the capacity to love, that you can continually love even when you get hurt, when we get hurt. Because the Spirit is constantly pouring out lavishly that love into our hearts. That's one of the Spirit's roles that He has. And it's it's where we get the power of love in our lives to continually keep giving to others. It's such a cool thing. In Ephesians, Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4, Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the Spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. For there is one body and one Spirit. Just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future, there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, in all, and living through all. Ephesians 4, 3-6 to in the New Living Translation. And, and the Spirit is actively involved in building unity and oneness in our lives. It's a great thing. There's, there, You know, like in the church, it, it's about unity. The Spirit is constantly trying to build unity. And that's perhaps why there's so many one another relationships and and the need to work in community in in, in relation to one another so that we can work things out to experience true unity. Division is such a satanic thing in the Bible. It, It breaks God's heart. It breaks people's hearts. It breaks the Spirit's heart to to see division take place. It's 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 something wow it, it encourages me that the spirit is the one trying to build unity and calls us to be involved in being united with the spirit and and pursue unity in the church. You know, there are so many more ways the spirit is actively at work in our lives and I've given you seven so far. The, you know, the spirit gives us gifts for use in his body, the spirit will reveal to us the wisdom of God and like 40 other things that I can't talk about right now this morning. We are so blessed to be Christians and have given a gift that gives us power in our lives. You know, for the sake of time, I just want to share one more passage in Acts chapter 1 in verse 8 and then we'll get to our two practicals. Luke says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Amazing passage here at Acts 1 verse 8 in the NIV. The last thing I wanted to talk about today is that the Spirit has always been involved in mission and empowers mission in our lives that we would be involved in changing the world. It's not you or I that change the world. It's the Spirit. That is His role. 
He is the one that empowers mission in the church. And I don't just mean making disciples. I mean helping the poor. The Luke 4 passage about mission, where we're preaching the gospel to the poor. That's why we're we're doing more things in our church about community service projects so we can get active in our communities and and being giving and helping in ways uh, that could not only benefit others' lives, but also benefit our lives as well as we try to live like Jesus and and do and participate in the Spirit's work. But the but the Spirit is the one that empowers mission in the church. You know, you could say he's the truest missionary. It's not you, it's not me. You know, Acts 2 in verse 17, the outpouring of the Spirit would be given to the community of God's people. And that was a profound thing that was taking place in, in the early church. You know, it, it wasn't a just it wasn't just a select few. You didn't have to be a Levite or a priest to to be able to be empowered, you know, and to, to have access to God. The Spirit would be given to ordinary people. Not just a select few, not just leaders, but every ordinary person in the world would be given the, the outpouring of the Spirit, and that Spirit would empower mission in their life. They would dream dreams and have great visions. That was a huge shift in the story of God's people. Ordinary people would experience dreams and visions now. That was exciting news for God's people. And I want to ask you, what new visions and dreams will the Spirit put on our hearts in the 21st century. You know, N.T. Wright, who is an author, a New Testament scholar at the University of Oxford in England, an Anglican bishop and a theologian said, the point of the Spirit is to enable those who follow Jesus to take it into all the world, the news that He is Lord, that He has won the victory over the evil forces of evil, that a new world has opened up, And that we are to help make it happen. You want to talk about having purpose in your life. You want to talk about uh, how important, how significant the life of a Christian is and your life as a Christian. The Spirit empowers us for mission, participating in new creation in the world. We get to be involved. God involves us. Partiz- per- in- invites us to participate in reconciling and restoring a lost world to new creation. And that gives you the power to experience new creation in your life for the rest of your life. And right now in the world, our world is pretty dark. And the church can shine brightly right now in the midst of darkness. How? By learning to access the Spirit's power. By realizing the, the gift that we have been given, that the Spirit lives within us. In the Old Testament, it lived in the tabernacle, but in the New Testament, it lives within you and I as Christians. So how do we give ourselves the best chance at alignment with the Spirit? How do we access the Spirit's power in our lives? And I want to talk about two practicals and close out here. One is postures, about having a posture of humility and patience, you know. I I use patience too, but really humility, a posture of humility as well as uh, practices, how, learning how to develop new ways to engage with God uh, in our own Christian lives. You know, the example I give oftentimes about this, how do we reach alignment with the Spirit? How do we get an alignment with God? It's like going to a chiropractor, right? And then when a chiropractor aligns uh, a, someone's spine, if it's in alignment, healing naturally occurs and naturally happens. And, and it's so powerful you don't have to make you don't have to make something happen it just happens because it's in alignment and when we are in alignment with god through our posture with god and participating in practices of the spirit you know that slow us down so that we can hear god we will experience his power naturally isn't that cool you don't have to like muster up all this power to to be able to experience the power of of the spirit we can work at alignment and the and the best chance at that kind of alignment is through our posture the way we are before god the way we come to god isn't that cool you know and and the practices that we have that we do in our daily lives that 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 help us to reach alignment so that natural healing natural power natural spirit's power flows through us you know in school my professors sometimes would talk about passages like in galatians 5 about keeping in step with the spirit 
meaning that's a that's an image meaning that you know the spirit is ahead of us so far ahead of us calling us calling the church into new realities and possibilities and so we're called to keep in step with what he may be doing in the world our job is to like robert's lesson last week is to listen it's to slow down long enough to listen and hear his whisper hear him revealing god's will God's wisdom. One of the roles of the Spirit is to reveal the wisdom of God to us, you know, and our role is to learn to become discerners and interpreters of what the Spirit may be doing in the world today and what the Spirit may be up to. The challenge is we easily fall prey to three killers of the spiritual life. And here are the three killers of the spiritual life. My wife was sharing a book that she read on on hurrying, you know. And the three killers of the spiritual life is hurry, crowds, and noise. Hurry, crowds, and noise. Oh my gosh. I I look at that slide and I go, that's me right there. Are you running so fast in life? Are you too busy to slow down? Are you too frantic because too many things are, you got too many things going on, attending to too many things that just, you know, take you farther and farther away from God or cloud your mind up and heart up so much where we just cannot hear what God is saying and what the Spirit perhaps is telling us at that time. I want you to look in Luke, uh, in Acts chapter 10 for a minute uh, at a passage about posture here. In Acts chapter 10, you know, and, and this is about Peter and the early church and, and a huge moment in the church that was Jewish, but now the Spirit was including the Gentiles for salvation, which was a huge shift for Peter and the early church. And we get to see what sometimes uh, is referred to as the Spirit surprise, that, that we're going in this direction, but the Spirit intervenes and often in, 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 in different ways uh, cause things to happen where there's a surprise that takes place, that, that, that new ways of thinking occurs because of a situation. And often disruption is the means to that happening um, in the spirit's life. And what a huge shift is. Look at, look at, as Peter was working with the church and it was, and the early church was moving forward in mission, you know, it was only for the Jews, but then now God was including the Gentiles, which has always been his heart is to include the Gentiles. And it was a shift. And Peter was in that moment where he was caught in a situation, kind of in a conundrum, you know, where he was, he was being, the spirit was talking with him and he was in a new situation now that he wasn't in before. And that posture of humility is what I appreciate so much about Peter that allowed him to go into a direction that, that could have caused a major uproar in the church, you know, could have, could have taken the church in a completely different direction than the, than the spirit wanted to go. In Acts chapter 10 and verse 44, it says, While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles, meaning it was a surprise to them that the Gentiles were now being included. What a huge challenge that was for everyone who was Gentile before, now seeing that the Spirit was being poured out to the Gentiles, you know, instead of only the Jews. For they were heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. And what a, the Jews were astonished and surprised that the Gentiles were being included for salvation. But look at Peter's posture, one of humility. And I appreciate that. You can see the spirit surprised, the spirit taking the church in a new direction. Because of this incident right here, because of this interaction right here, we who are Gentiles could become Christians. Our salvation was linked to this one moment here. And Peter was a primary figure in this. But, and he had a posture of humility that allowed the Spirit to work in his life, as well as the work of the Jews, the circumcised believers, that, that they were able to get over that hump, to try something new, when in fact it, it could have been in their favor just to kind of hold to old traditions and old ways. This was a new beginning for the church of, of the Gentiles getting salvation. Imagine for a minute if Peter was too proud, if he didn't want to try new ways of lear- learning and growing. That he only stuck to his normal traditions instead of venturing out and listening to the Spirit's guidance here. 
it would have been a huge mistake not to listen to the Spirit's leadership. And perhaps we don't even know what would perhaps have happened to the Gentiles and salvation in this situation right here. Now, how about you? How about me? One thing about the Spirit is that He will execute God's will, and that may not be our will. Are you, are we open to the Spirit's surprise? This man named Stanley Harvalls said, It is the nature of the Holy Spirit to shake up the church, particularly when the church becomes self-satisfied and content with the status quo. Wow, what a great quote there. And and uh, you know, as 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 we have a certain posture of humility, it gives us the best chance at alignment with the spirit and experiencing his power and new creation that comes with with listening to the spirit surprise. The second chance at alignment is by participating in practices that slow us down to connect with God. What new practices are you participate, participating in so that you can experience new alignment? Hey, it's great to 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 go to your go-to things, you know, in your own Bible study and prayer. But just like the spirit's leadership here at the early church, perhaps God is helping us you know, who've been a part of the church for a long time to experience new ways to engage with God and experience alignment and the Spirit's power. I want to encourage us to to venture in and, and to go where the Spirit perhaps may be taking us, taking you or taking us. So today, what did we learn? The power of the Spirit. We looked at who the Spirit is, what the Spirit does in our lives. He is not just in the Bible. He is active in the world and in our lives. We have so much power in our lives. He is actively involved in scripture as being an advocate or counselor, comforter in our life or counselor. He will teach and and remind us. He helps in the process of rebirth. It's not up to you and I. Yes, we, we get to participate in it, but he is the one guiding the process. He helps in our time of weakness. He pours out love. He rebuilds unity and oneness and he empowers mission. Well, how do we access that power? Well, through our postures and practices that help us align with the Spirit. It gives us the best chance at alignment. Let's work at the posture of humility. Amen. I'm, I'm going to be working on it. You know, I appreciate, you know, our, our church that loves to venture into new things at times. Let's put work into our practices as well and learn perhaps some new practices that help us to slow us down to engage with God and hear his whisper and his call. Let's also remember the three killers of the spiritual life, hurry, crowds, and noise. Well, why is all this important to know? It's so that we understand the Spirit's power in our lives. It's so we can participate with the Spirit in living our best life today. And so we can also be involved with our triune God in the greatest mission of reconciling and restoring a lost world to new creation. And I hope, you know, today's lesson encouraged you this morning. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for your attention. Have a great day. Thank you for joining us. I hope this has been educational and inspiring for you. If you'd like to know more, please join us by going to study.laicc.net and we'll be happy to contact you and help you in any way we can.